With Blue Link Plus, you can access your Hyundai Tucson Limited remotely. Doors unlocked, temperature set, lost car found. There it is. Get complimentary class leading Blue Link Plus. Call 562-314-4603 for complete details. You've discovered your link to GoPowerCat.com's PowerCat podcast. Now, here's your host, GoPowerCat.com publisher, Tim Fitzgerald. Welcome to another edition of the PowerCat Questions podcast. Our subscribers at GoPowerCat.com get the privilege, the honor, and the responsibility of asking us questions on a weekly basis for us to answer on this here podcast. Tim Fitzgerald, Zach Carlson, Ryan Gilbert, your usual trio of Go Power Cat peoples. I'm in my home studio. Guys, we were going to do this from all of us here, and we totally forgot. We almost forgot the podcast, let alone doing it together. I don't want to get out in the cold. Yeah, that's true. I don't either. I was... Uh, we're going to your house. <laughs> I, I don't... Yeah, I, I've got a brisket to smoke, and it was going to be for the Super Bowl, then I decided to wait for a little bit warmer weather, not because the the smoker will have a problem. I'll have a problem going out to put it on the smoker. That's how soft I am. Don't be soft yourself. Make sure you get to the fridge. Yeah, that, that really didn't work out quite the way I thought it would be. Hmm. Get to the fridge every time you need to buy liquor, beer, wine or other stuff to make your party complete. The Fridge Wholesale Liquor right here in Manhattan, Kansas, at the corner of this and that in the town in which I live. Our segment sponsors are Tanner's. The boys joined me at Tanner's for a few refreshments last Friday night. Now that I'm vaccinated and ready to return to public visibility, no longer hiding in my basement, although I'm hiding in my basement from the cold now. It was very fun. We didn't go anywhere else. I had forgotten that bars close at midnight because COVID gets nasty at 1201. COVID's like that uncle who comes in for graduation and doesn't know how to handle a late night at the bars. And at 1201, Uncle COVID becomes an ass. He's drunk. He's rowdy. He's infecting people. So, yeah, we didn't make it to any other bars. But if we had, we might have gone to the high-low, which is right down the road. And it's neither high nor low. It's at street level. It's just kind of weird. Get to all of those places. Support local businesses, please. Please, please. Pretty please. Zach, what do we got today? We, I hope we got some basketball because I'm fired up to talk some hoops. We're going to talk about some basketball and a little bit of fan base type questions and a little bit of Gene Taylor discussion. That'll be interesting. Hmm. I'm a little uh, a little baffled by some of the stuff taking place, but we'll get into all that. I'm looking forward to discussing that. I, in fact, I'm going to be writing a column assessing Gene Taylor's comments, and it's going to take some thought. And as Gills knows well, I'm not prone to deep thought. But anyhow, let's get going. Here's your questions from Wabash Station. We're going to talk about basketball in the first half, and Zach Carlson will have your questions. From Anderson Blumont, if the poll on Wabash Station is a good sample of the fan base, it seems that about 80% of fans are ready to move on from Bruce Weber, while 20% want him back. Could you do a point, counterpoint on the podcast, first siding with the 80% and then siding with the 20%? Very interesting. Uh, first of all, I don't think it's 80 20. I mean, we're just talking about vocal people, and I think a lot of people who are supportive are, are hiding right now. I think it's it's high. I think it's two thirds, one third, probably. I think it's a majority would like to move on. I've seen some people who have been supportive of Bruce. Finally, this has gone too far. Um, I mean, the reasons why you make a change are obvious. You shouldn't be this bad. I mean, Having to rebuild after winning a championship, first of all, is a is a false argument. That's that shouldn't happen. You might be down a little bit, but having to do a ground up rebuild like we've seen two times now, that shouldn't happen. That just that isn't a natural occurrence. But this rebuild is particularly troubling because it was gone. Everything was gone. And now they're gonna put up back to back 
the worst seasons in K-State basketball history since World War II. And, you know, by all accounts ever, because you play more games now, it's more visible. These are horrible seasons. This should be the end of a coach. There's no doubt in my mind. This wasn't caused by COVID. It was compounded by COVID. I mean, let's be blunt here. This team wasn't going to win. <clears throat> excuse me. This team wasn't going to win a bunch of games this season with eight newcomers and one senior who is a great kid, but not a great basketball player. He's a good basketball player. Sometimes not even that. So this was going to be a difficult season before COVID came along. COVID made it worse because the guys never got really enough time to learn what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. But without many seniors or veterans in practice, some of those lessons were going to be stunted anyhow. I mean, the previous rebuild, you had some guys on the team with a better understanding of how to compete. I mean, three of the four returning players had only played one season at K-State, and it was the season with the most losses in school history. So that they're not exactly a great reference. I, as AD, would have made a change, and I like Bruce as a person. But this isn't about being likable, and it really isn't about the ups, because now the downs have far outweighed the ups. You're well below 500 in conference play with two seasons out of your nine, 14 and four with a shared Big 12 title. You have two seasons where you're 20 games above 500 in conference play. And yet, over the course of your nine seasons, you are still below 500 and sinking. So that means you're roughly, what, 30 games below 500 in the other seven seasons. Folks, that's, that's not acceptable. And I think I've been clear through the years that I would have moved on after the first one. Because, frankly, I, I thought it took too long to rebuild. <clears throat> and the only thing that saved Bruce Weber was the first four, which is put in place to save coaches just like Bruce Weber, to say that you made the NCAA tournament, even though when you made the field of 64, you got flattened by an okay Cincinnati team. So, I mean, the reasons are obvious why you make a change. The reasons you don't is how Gene Taylor looks at this. You you asserted yourself and said, yes, I'm standing up for Bruce Weber. He gets this season to rebuild. Now, maybe personally you put some caveats on that, but not if they do this or that and that. But it seems like Gene hasn't done that from everything he's saying publicly now. Doesn't matter how bad they are, he will get next season and will go by that as judge. The problem is, of course, you don't know what then the the rules are for that. I mean, winning five games in the Big 12 is a remarkable improvement over the last two seasons, and that's not enough, but maybe it will be. So I don't appreciate the lowering of the bar. I didn't appreciate it under Wildridge and Asbury, although I liked both guys. You can't lower the bar to make yourself feel like you're more accomplished than you are. Two Big 12 championships are notable. They're great. They're wonderful. But they don't inoculate, inoculate you from all the other issues you have. It isn't a teeter-totter where one size, one side evens out the other. We're now on the bad side. So um, I see why Gene's going to do it. I understand. And I'll have a lot more thoughts about this later for our subscribers at GoPowerCat.com. But those are how I see it. Guys, what do you want to add to that? To, to get to the initial question of the 80-20 split, I think that's probably fair. I don't think that it's unrepresentative of the, of the fan base, especially, you know, even if, if the most vocal people are voting, you know, it still could be a bunch of people that aren't necessarily on the message boards. They might just say, hey, you know, click, you know, whatever. I think it's probably pretty fair. Uh, but what I want to, the point I want to make is how many of the, the people that are siding with Bruce, siding with the 20%, like you say, how many of those people are truly supporters of Bruce or are they supporters of the financial stability of the athletic department? Because I understand, you know, there, there's certainly, you know, Gene Taylor's not sitting in his office like, wow, Bruce is doing such a great job. We're going to keep him. He's not thinking that this season is terrible. And he's thinking about the bottom line. And if getting rid of a guy is not good for the athletic department, yeah. 
you know, I, I wish part of me wishes that Gene would just come out and say, we can't afford it. We can't afford to fire our coach instead of just coming out, you know, in January saying we're going to stick with them, you know, because they haven't won a game since the beginning of the new year. So coming out in, in defense of your coach just seems kind of strange and, and ridiculous, you know, it just there's reasons and and I wish I kind of wish that Gene would just come out and flat out say hey this is this is what's going on but you know him coming out and just talking just it kind of baffles me just when you're this bad and there's the chance that you could get rid of him just stay silent I think the silence would speak louder at this point than what he's saying right now I don't know if that would send the best message to not only Bruce but his players if you say, hey, we're, we're not firing you simply because of a financial situation. So I get what you're saying, but think if you're no. not back and you hear that, well, that's not the best thing to hear. No, but him coming out in the first place saying, well, we're going to keep him in, in January and they've lost nine in a row. It's just like and, and you see that it's not going to get any better. It just it seems like empty words to me. Mm-hmm. Going back to the question, though, I think if. If Pack and Bradford are here in three years, then they will get a lot better and they'll have a chance to do something special. So that's kind of the other side of the argument that I'm kind of alone on with that 20% or, or one third, whatever you want to put that number at. You know, Weber is the only coach that's not named Bill Self to, to win multiple Big 12 titles since his time here. So I, that's my biggest argument against uh, wanting to fire Bruce. And obviously, this situation is terrible that, that K State's in right now. But if if Pack and Bradford, I've said this all along. If they stay around for a couple of years, they'll be they'll do something special. But they've got to stay around. Bruce has got to keep them uh, keep them bought into the program. And for the sake of making an argument, before we move on here, <laughs> K State is so bad right now that how are they going to get worse? Are they going to be worse next year? I mean, it's it's almost impossible for K State to be worse next year, whether you keep Bruce or you get rid of him. You know, so. I, w- I would like to see a change, but at the same time, it's clear he's going to get better next year. I mean, there's we're at the floor. We're in the basement. There's there's nowhere else to go except losing two games to Iowa State. That is yeah. That, that is the only that is the only way that you could be worse than this year, and that's that's mind blowing to me. That Iowa State <laughs> is still worse than K State. It's unbelievable, man. It's they almost they, won the last night. basement. Iowa State is halfway through the earth <laughs> in the center of the core. I'm I'm surprised they haven't fired their coach already. I mean, just get started with the process because he's yeah. gone. Um, we, I would imagine. I can't imagine they'll keep him. Yeah, every time I think uh, this is awful and it's unprecedented, I have to remind myself. Well, they did win. And beat Iowa State, and Iowa State has not won a game. Although, as Gills just said, they were more competitive last night at TCU. Both of the bottom dwellers lost by three uh, Wednesday or Tuesday in basketball, so that's pretty interesting. God dang it, reschedule that game. I, I'm frustrated. I, I know it's the one game that does not impact the postseason in any way. I mean, it, what's it matter if you're the ninth or tenth seed going into the Big Twelve tournament? You're probably on paper going to lose to the seventh or eighth place team. And the team that wins isn't going to have an improved resume for the postseason. Neither team's doing anything come postseason time other than starting off season workouts. So I get why the conference hasn't done it. I mean, poor Iowa State, they played well Tuesday, and they have a Thursday Saturday doubleheader with Kansas. Had to get that game in because Kansas needs the win. So uh, we'll see how that plays out. And, you know, K, KU got an extra day. K-State's game with KU was moved back to Wednesday, so they get an extra day of rest after after playing three games this week. So, all right, guys, uh, I'm invested in the players, and I'm going to keep saying this because if Bruce Weber's the coach or someone else is the coach, the players are the core. The, the players will be the team. And I implore fans not to take your frustrations out on the players. They didn't sign up for this. 
When they signed a scholarship agreement with Kansas State or a letter of intent, they came to win basketball games, and it was the coaches that failed them before they ever arrived by losing in a roster. And really, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. If Levi Stockard and David Sloan stay, this is still a bad team. Maybe a little bit better, but a bad team. So it's really about neglecting recruiting for too long. And now, as they're backed up against the cliff's edge, they said, hey, we better recruit. And they did a good job. This this is about the best you're going to see from this staff in terms of recruiting. There isn't one single guy on the roster that I think has to go. He's useless. Even Suri Lewis, who doesn't play much, and he was the last guy added, there's something there. I mean, the fact that this season doesn't count at all, and he'll be a freshman again next season, that's good. Now, do I think all the players will stay? No, for two reasons. One, that's never happened under Bruce Weber. It's an ongoing issue, and I recognize that. It's been ridiculous, and it's it's just a it's something that has been tolerated that shouldn't. Too many players don't finish their career at K-State, but... With that said, too many players don't finish their career at K-State because they never should have been recruited to play at K-State. They haven't been good enough. So, yeah, players will leave. They will. But that's going to happen at virtually every NCAA basketball program this season. The transfer portal is enticing. You're not playing enough? Go to the transfer portal. You're not happy with your coach? Go to the transfer portal. You've had off-court issues, whether academic or maybe criminal, go to the transfer portal. Everything will be new and fresh and wonderful, and your hopes and dreams will be fulfilled. It doesn't work out that way, but that's the way it feels to them, so players will transfer. Now, what players become the key? I've got a core group of players I don't want to see transfer, and if they do, I think that is a recruiting failure, huge recruiting failure. We'll see. We'll see. I, I'm i caught in this nether region in between the two groups. I get why you're mad. I'm mad, too, that the program's in this circumstance. But I can't build a time machine. I can't go back and change what K-State decided on whether to keep Bruce Weber or not. Here we are. He was given the season. So, again, I will invest my attention in the players. And I saw them get better the last two games of the season that have taken place so far this season. I've seen them improve. And I'm sorry if I find that encouraging and you only want to talk about wins or losses, but I made it clear at the start of the season this was not going to be a year I wanted to talk about wins or losses because they were going to lose. They were going to lose a crap load of games with or without COVID. Here we are. They're losing a crap load of games. But now they're getting better. And some of you still don't want to accept that improvements are being made. And I greatly respect Jay Heydrich and and his thought that it's always driven him and myself crazy that playing hard shouldn't be a reward. We won the play hard chart. That, That should be a bottom line, essential ingredient to any basketball program, any athletic program. Any athlete should have the self expectation of stepping on the field of competition and competing hard. But it's hard to do when you don't know what you're doing. How do you compete hard when you don't know what you're supposed to do offensively, where you're supposed to go, how you're supposed to do it? You haven't been trained to do it because you didn't have enough practice. How do you play hard when you don't know what your defensive rotation was supposed to be because you haven't had enough practice? I mean, it's, it's difficult to play hard when you're lost. In football, they call it letting the game slow down for you. It wasn't that you weren't playing hard. It's just now you know exactly what to do and when to do it, and you do it quickly and decisively. And I am seeing that from this basketball team in these last few games. I thought they played really good defense for much of the game, and Texas still hit 65% of their shots in the first half. I I haven't gone back and mathed it out, if you want to say it that way, but I think that 65% lasted for a good 28 minutes of the game. 27 minutes of the game. And then K-State's defense settled in, and Texas ended up shooting 50%. So that means they really struggled down the stretch. They didn't play hard 
as much as they knew what the hell they were doing. They were rotating on defense. They were keeping their body in front of ball uh, handlers. They were doing all those little things that you should be able to do when you step on the court, but not if you haven't had enough practice. You didn't have an off season. You didn't have a complete team. Oh, those are excuses. It's the freaking reality of the situation. One, the program shouldn't be this young. That is the fault of the coaching staff and its recruiting. But two, you can't expect these players to be acceptably good if they haven't had enough practice. Those are both real things. So Bruce will probably be back for season 10. And here's the thing. From the start of the season, from the start of the season, I think it's important for K-State fans to set a goal. What is acceptable in a post-COVID, if we're there, situation with a bunch of young players who have a season under their belt and a couple new guys and, and if some guys leave, don't go get another freshman you're gambling on. Get into the portal. Use it. Use it to your advantage instead of the constant disadvantage of your program. Oh, some guys weren't good enough to play at this level, so they left? Don't go out and find more guys that fit the same mold. Go out and find some guys that have proven they can play some basketball. Maybe they're a great defender. Maybe they're a great ball handler, a great leader. Or even if it's as simple as they do everything right that will help your young players learn how to do Everything right. Fix yourself through the portal instead of suffering the damage of the portal. Let's see what next season brings. Would I love to have a coaching change? Yeah. I I really like Bruce. But this isn't acceptable, and it shouldn't be to anyone. But it's not my choice. It's not your choice, and you can bellyache and whine. And I have hit my head against that wall. And it doesn't work. So I'm invested in the players. Let's see what happens. So it happens, and let's go into next season with some some realistic expectations. For me, it's eight and ten. That seems to be the the sign of building for this program. Every time they go eight and ten, they take the next step. They go ten and eight, they go fourteen and four. That's been the history. So let's judge this program next season by the man's own history. I say eight and ten. We'll see what Gene thinks. Maybe four and fourteen is good enough. It's not for me. Um, another question from Anderson Blumont. Does the 20% of board members who think Bruce deserves another year surprise you considering K-State is rated by Ken Palm to be the worst power six team in all of college basketball this year combined with what trans and then combine that with what transpired after last season? Um, some people just want a nice coach. I mean, they don't want to be embarrassed by off-the-court situations. <clears throat> they don't want to be caught cheating. They don't want someone that embarrasses them because they yells at players. And then probably 20% of all fan bases are that way. I'll root for whoever's out there for the team. I don't know. I, I, I don't buy into the Ken Palm thing because I watch basketball and I watched Kansas State win at Iowa State. That, that pretty much tells me K-State's better than Iowa State. Maybe they haven't been at points of this season, but when they stepped on the court on December, what was it? Whatever it was, 16, whatever, they were better on Iowa State's home court. That tells me all I need to know. Ken Palm, I'm sure he's a nice guy. He's great at a holiday party, but he's not the end-all, be-all on, on basketball. K-State beat Iowa State head-to-head. I'll take K-State. And if they play again in Manhattan, I'll take K-State, particularly with how the team's playing right now. And it kind of goes back into my thing. Of those 20%, what are are the reasons of the 20% that they want to keep Bruce? Is it because they like Bruce, or is it because they understand the realities of of the hand that K-State and Gene Taylor has been dealt? So that's kind of what I think about is – I'm sure there's some people in that 20% that are like, yeah, let's get rid of him. But I know that it may not be best for the university long term. So I, I, I resonate with those people, I guess. But to the Ken Palm thing, I don't, I, I don't have a problem with it. K-State is the worst according to that statistical calculation. And if Iowa State's above them, so be it. They've, 
I, I don't know how Ken Palm works, but at the very least, they're doing something better than K-State to put them up the rankings. That's how I see it. Gills? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> here we go again, but I yeah. agree. You guys brought up some some good points. I mean, the Ken Palm, I, I'm with you, Fitz. I don't care what the, the numbers say. I, I don't see how Iowa State could be ranked ahead of K-State, but that's just me. But I mean, overall, with, with the 20%, um, the question going back to that, um, I think you can – never mind. Scratch that. Lost my thought. Lost my thought. Well, the thing about Ken Palm is it – it defeats your argument that it's all about wins and losses because Iowa State has lost more than K-State. They've lost by less. So now that counts? Now that matters? Now, so, you know, whatever the judgment is, I'm fine. I, I Granted, probably K-State's lost a four-day state, just tanked them. And they earned that. They deserve that. And tanked them with a lot of fans. And for many fans, it was the point of no return. You're just not going to come back from that. You lose to Fort Hays State. You didn't lose to a Division II program from Tennessee or or Washington State. You lost to one that's a few hours down the road. It's not acceptable. It wasn't. You should have had your team better prepared. If you want to fault Bruce here, maybe he made it too complex for them early in this year. They should have been working on things that they were ready to do that they could accomplish within the course of a game. Simplify everything, you know, strip it down. But does that really fulfill what his goals are? That this season was for rebuilding to get the team ready. So is the team going to be as good next season if you cut corners this season? I don't know. I got my I got my thought back here. When Snyder <laughs> two point was in his last couple of years, I wanted him to leave, and I love Snyder. Don't get me wrong; everything about him, I love, but the games were getting so ugly and there was no light at the end of the tunnel. It seemed like for that program with coach Snyder, you know, for the football team. So I I'd say that the thing with, with Weber is there is light at the end of the tunnel with pack and Bradford and those guys. So, you know, that's probably with the 20%, like I was thinking, cause I've been a Royals fan and a chiefs fan my whole life. And I've never once wanted any of their coaches to be fired just because I'm so big of a fan that I will support whoever's there. Um, but I think that just the optimism and, and if the guys can stay around, then that's what's going to keep you bought in if you're that 20%. Not even Ned Yost. I love Ned. I love Ned. Is that when he kept putting Soria in? Or was that after that? I, I don't know. There was, there was a point where the Royals lost 10 games and one of the greatest tweets I've ever <sighs> seen. You know, this is, this is a long, long time ago and a, a sidetrack here, but it said, you know the last MLB team to make the postseason after losing 10 games and how they got there? They fired Ned Yost because that's what happened when he got fired in Milwaukee. They ended up making the postseason once he got fired. So I remember that. I remember that. Never has a coach gone from more, not despised, but just – Fans were uncertain about him to yeah. being loved than Ned Yost. Yeah. Winning. More from Anderson Blumont here. So Bruce, let's, say, let's say Bruce does indeed get another year. What would have to happen in terms of improvement next year for him to get another year, which would in essence require another contract extension for recruiting purposes? Mm -hmm. Eight and 10 is, I think, a low bar. That, I mean, not even expecting your team to be average in the conference in which they play is a low bar to me. But some people say, well, that's too much. They've only won four or five games over the last two seasons. You want to win eight? You, gotta, you have to get to where you think your program should be. What is your baseline on your program? And what is the realistic expectation for your program? If you're not going to cheat and you're not going to be able to get the five-star one-and-dones, his upside's been terrific. His downside's been too low. So you got to clear both bars, the low end and the high end, and he's done it on the high end. He's had two really great seasons and an Elite Eight run that still defies complete explanation, but it was great. It was fulfilling. It's fun. Is three out of nine seasons okay? I mean, when you consider that even in the Big 12 championship seasons, they lost in the first round of the NCAA tournament, isn't that really the measurement? So in some ways, they've only had one good season. I don't 
You just have to define how you're doing this. Figure it out, your definition. Thing is, Gene Taylor won't do that, nor should he do that. So we'll have this floating reality where we don't know if it's good enough or not. Get to 8 and 10. I feel like I'm compromising at 8 and 10. Because I personally think you should be 9 and 9. And if I really wanted to be a dick, I'd say, well, whatever the math is right now, um, at after 10 seasons, I want you to at least be 500 in the conference, which would be an almost impossible threshold for him to clear after these last two seasons. I think he'd have to go at least 14 and 4. I mean, I think in 10 seasons of a head coach, if you last 10 seasons, why aren't you average in your conference? Why? The ups are great. But this isn't normal. Folks that have decided, well, you have to rebuild if you want it. This isn't normal. Period. Yeah, you have some down times. But totally falling apart every time you win a conference title? That's freaking weird. Oh, well. Quit Fitz, settling. Since you, Fitz, since you brought it up about the, you know, making getting back to 500 or you know having a wins threshold i kind of feel like that's the case the way i see it is k-state is a baseball team in september and they're two losses away from being eliminated eliminated from the postseason with 30 games to play or 25 games to play or whatever it feels like like the bar is so high and how unlikely it is that they will reach it that it just seems pointless to continue in this trajectory with bruce weber that's I think the part that gets a lot of fans is they can see how bad this team is. They know how high the bar needs to be in order to return some sense of normalcy. And then they look at next year and say, can we even hit that bar? Can we even get eight wins? Can we even get six wins? I think that's the frustrating thing. You know, like we've seen Bruce Weber the last nine years. We know what we have. Not knowing what you could be getting in the future, I mean, it's tempting. It's tempting to say, hey, we know what we've had. What we have really isn't great. Can we improve with what's behind door number two? That's the way I see it. Uh, Maybe I'm too competitive. Maybe I just have expectations and I don't accept being mediocre not in football and men's basketball I don't care if you're K-State I don't care who you are you should find a way within your resources to be as good as you possibly can be and if you fall short of that I'm not happy now does that mean every time I'm unhappy the coach should be fired? no but here we are I mean this is it You'll be back next season unless something happens. Well, Gene Taylor vaguely said if something happened off the court, does that include Nigel Pack or, or and Davian Bradford hitting the transfer portal? If six guys hit the transfer portal, but those two stay. Is that it? Is that enough? And all of a sudden you got six openings on your roster? I, I would think so. If we're going to invest in players, then you got to keep the players. We'll find out. Has there ever been a firing? I know the, the transfer transfer portal is young, but has there ever been a firing when, you know, a whole bunch of players, whether it's football or basketball or any other sport, maybe maybe Wichita State to an yeah. extent, but but a whole bunch of players leave the port leave, leave leave the school, enter the portal, and then they just say, you know what? If you're gonna have to rebuild it, we might as well get a new guy to rebuild it. I know that the Wichita State situation was completely different and not what this would be. But like you said, if Nigel Pack, you know, announces in, you know, late March, Davion Bradford, and they just keep coming, you know, it's that's kind of awkward to say, hey, coach, too many of your players are gone. Leave. Get out. You know, you lost your players. You know, why should we keep you? Wichita but, State's interesting to me because he wasn't really fired because the players left. The players left caused people to really look. Yeah. Because shame on Wichita State. Shame on them. They were indifferent to what a horrible human being Greg Marshall is. 
I mean, the second he took a swing at a student athlete, which turned out to have happened in the parking lot, he tried to punch a track athlete, should have been gone the next day. It's amazing. If you're winning off the court, doesn't matter. The quality of your person doesn't matter if you're winning. But if you're losing, that's all that matters. Well, he, he doesn't do anything embarrassing off the court, and he's a really nice guy. It's, it's funny how that works. So I, I just I have a standard. I want a good person who plays within the confines of the rules as um, enforced by the NCAA. Not the rules in the book, the rules enforced by the NCAA. Who does everything possible to win within those confines. And that includes using the transfer portal and not recruiting one-third of your players that just aren't good enough to ever have played here. So, I don't know, man. I, it's a confusing situation. I understand that fans are confused. It seems like there is no guideline, no rule book at which, with which anyone's playing with when it comes to K-State basketball. We make fun of the Asbury and Woldridge years, and they were never, ever this bad. I mean, they, they were kind of constantly rebuilding. But they always had a guy here or there. They always competed. And here we are. From T and Cat, he wants to tag on to Anderson Blumont's questions. And he asked, does athletic director Gene Taylor actually hear the voice of the fan? I know he mentioned he visited with some donors in Wichita. And a result of that going public, he may have backtracked some of what he said there. But does he really hear from the polls like you have on this site? Oh, man, I'm just going to say it. You don't matter, T and Cat. These message boards and Twitter, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you bought tickets for the last 50 years. Now, if you give a significant amount of money, that matters. You, you get some say. Just enough say to keep you happy. That's, a way, that's not a K-State thing. That's a college athletics thing. You know, Gene said, and correctly, that we have no big donors that have threatened to pull their money if they don't get their way. That's a K-State way. I mean, that's not a – K-Staters aren't that way. But apparently that would work. Bruce is smart. He's friends with all those guys that have that kind of power. They like him. Of course they like him. Everyone likes Bruce. Might annoy the crap out of us with his sideline annex, like the fit he threw against Texas Tech. That one just looked like he was not getting his snack in the middle of the afternoon. Pizza rolls. Pizza rolls. Well, speaking of Texas Tech, how about Chris Beard last night? Classic. <laughs> Classic. Do you think he sat down on purpose, or do you think he slipped? No, he was reenacting the timeout that was point. called. Yeah. Okay. He was. There was a timeout being called, and instead of them granting the timeout, his player was called for foul. And that was his point. Okay. Why did you call the foul when he's asking for a timeout? Call the timeout because calling the foul changes the entire outlook of the game. When the guy wanted a timeout. Gotcha. I only so, saw the clips. It, it just it looks very it looks so smooth like it looked smooth enough to where it's like he looked like he might have just slipped and played it off. But well, it was, <laughs> that was unbelievable. Oh well. I, I, if you've got if you're a big enough gun and you've got Millions of dollars to donate. You have a voice. You also have a friend named Bruce Weber. I'll say this. I, Gene Taylor deserves credit for answering his emails, even as late as 9 o'clock, whenever he said something, you know. And if somebody's upset, you know, if you, if you, if you talk to Gene, if you address him politely, he'll respond. You know, he's not going to ignore you, and he'll say, you know, thanks for your input. But the weight of your input isn't necessarily – Large, as Fitz said. I will get into all of this later at the site for our subscribers. But Gene, I believe, is playing a complex game here. I mean, he forced out a Hall of Fame coach because the program was coming apart. So now we want to believe that he doesn't see what's happening to his basketball program. 
Or maybe we just don't understand that basketball isn't as valuable to an athletic department as football. There's a lot of a lot of things going on here. It's a it's a complex formula that he's working. I, I kind of get what he's doing right now. But I would make a change. But I'm not in charge of the budget. I don't know how bad it is. But I, I'll just say this. If you're one of those people that demand a change that is done with Bruce Weber, but you hold on to your season tickets next year, you're part of the problem, man. You're not getting your message across. That's one of the things that I think Gene's going to be shocked at how small attendance numbers are in a post-COVID environment if this is the product. It's going to be bad. It's going to be really bad. What, Gills, you and Goins decided about 500 people at the game last night? <laughs> if even that. You can't even get your $1,500 person allotment filled. No one wants to go watch. And it's COVID. Riley, Riley County could lift the restrictions and let Bramlage be 100% capacity. And people, they wouldn't fill it up. The people. sections in the corners are literally zero people in an entire section. That's a, that's my point. Folks, if you want to go to a game, you can go to a game and stay 30 feet away from anyone else. There's something bigger here than just COVID. Maybe it's an excuse. But if you really vehemently want Bruce gone and you renew your season tickets, just shut up, sit down, and, and watch the product. From El Camino Cat, last question of the first half. How crazy is it that Last season, the men's basketball coach led the team to a last place conference finish, and the AD didn't give him a performance review. See John, Gene Taylor's comments to John Kurtz for reference. Um, um, I, I can't explain it. I know that if you go back to the end of the season, it was chaotic. It, I mean, we're not going to revise history and not embrace the fact that how much we've changed since the time, the day I drove to Kansas City for the Big 12 tournament. The day I drove, as far as I knew, the Big 12 tournament was going on as planned. By the time I got midway through that K-State game, I realized, well, things were bad. But I still thought the tournament would go on. And then one NBA guy gets COVID, says some idiotic things, does some idiotic things. And Fred Hoiberg gets sick on the bench without COVID. It wasn't COVID at all. And it was done. It was done. It changed so quickly. It was chaotic. And guys like Gene were trying to figure out what does this mean for basketball? Well, what about football? I mean, there were so many things going on. Who gets to show up to work? It's a pandemic. We're all going to die. So it was a chaotic time. I get it. Pick up the phone, man. Gene Taylor didn't know what Zoom was on that day. Neither did I. But pick up the phone. A week later, April 1, May 1, pick up the phone. Do it over the phone. Bruce has probably got an iPhone. You've got an iPhone. You can face-to-face -face on an iPhone. So I don't... I. I think that's neglect of duty. And I love Gene Taylor. I think he's a great guy. I think he neglected his duty to give one of your highest paid employees the end of year review that you should give, particularly when he's getting paid millions of dollars. You didn't, you weren't shepherding the dollars that being given to you from donors, ticket purchasers, and Revenue from the conference. You're in charge of that. I, I think he blew it. But I admire him for admitting it. It's crazy. Yeah. I don't have anything else to add, Fitz. It's wild, but it's wild, but he didn't give one. You know, with Zoom, when was our first Zoom press conference that we had with, with Chris Kleiman? I think Chris Kleiman was the first person. Was it May? I mean, by May, the athletic department figured out how to make stuff work. Mm-hmm. You know, 
it shouldn't take long to figure out Zoom or, or a phone call or even just show up. You know, it wasn't like COVID was bad in the spring like it is now. I get that there were a lot of unknowns and it's easy to sit here and and armchair this thing, but it's not like it was total it would have been totally unreasonable to you to for you guys to figure out some way to review the performance at the end of the year and set expectations for this season, even in light of a pandemic season that we're seeing. Well, that's it for the first half of the podcast. In the second half, we will either talk about football or I'll give Ryan Gilbert a performance review live on the Powercat Questions podcast. The Powercat Podcast will be right back. Getting the crew together isn't as easy as it used to be. We get it. Life comes at you fast. But trust us, your pals are desperate for a good hang. And when they hear you stock the party with drinks from Drizzly, they'll be banging down your door. Let Drizzly, the go-to app for drink delivery, take care of the supplies. All you need is an excuse. It doesn't even have to be a good one. It's your dog's birthday. The loquats are finally ripe. Whatever. With Drizzly, you can compare prices on a massive selection of beer, wine, and spirits and get them delivered straight to your door, which means you can entice the crew to leave their houses without ever leaving yours. Whatever the occasion, download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com today. Must be 21 plus, not available in all locations. Selling a little or a lot? Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage, to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage. Shopify is here to help you grow, whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits. Shopify helps you sell everywhere, from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify has got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. 15% better on average compared to other other leading commerce platforms. And sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning 24-7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash odyssey podcast all lowercase go to shopify.com slash odyssey podcast now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in shopify.com slash odyssey podcast we now send it back to the power cat podcast Welcome back to the PowerCat Questions Podcast. We have discussed basketball until half the people stop listening. That's that's kind of our core philosophy. Let's beat that horse until people can't watch anymore. Tim Fitzgerald, Zach Carlson, Ryan Gilbert. Gills is going to take over asking questions as we shift our attention to football. But we always have our attention on the fridge wholesale liquor. Like heart eyes, right? Like the emoji with the hearts over your eyes? That's me looking at the fridge. Make sure you stop in the fridge whenever you're in town. And make sure you support local businesses such as Tanner's and the High Low in Aggieville. They are open for business. Give them yours if you choose to go to a bar, restaurant, or whatever in person. Here we go. Gills, take it away. First question of the second half from I Like Pickles Cat. Paraphrase of Kellis. Could God himself have kept that Skyler press conference a normal length? No. God could not have himself kept that press conference a normal length. Would God have asked four or five questions? If so, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. I mean, the pandemic cost us, and probably permanently, the power chat, which we loved. Right, Zach? Yeah. It was cool. We had a studio. We're really not set up. We could probably figure out how to do it here. It just wouldn't be very good. But that the one I did with Skyler was so easy. Skyler, tell me about 
and then I just kind of sit back. I mean, I think it was like four or five questions per half hour. And that's yeah. it was a half hour press conference with Skyler. Brevity isn't his thing. He's very deep. It's not like he's just talking in circles. He he's saying stuff. Yeah. Uh, he just. I would love to put him and Stan Weber in a room together. Just and, talk about football. Just talk about football and see how long it is before they come out of that room. I don't want to listen, but it'll be it'll be substantial. Maybe a week. Maybe a week they'll emerge and say, we need to use the restroom. We've been talking about football for a week. We gave you like an hour and a half of Skylar Thompson video content the last three weeks or so. It's a lot of Skylar. Yeah. Bless his heart. But I'm glad he's back. I'm I'm really happy for the football program. Football program. I'm also happy that I can speak. Program. Hey, what is that your are cars racing by your place there, Gills? Yep. Man. Sorry, I should beat myself. <laughs> I'm That's not talking. Fine. You're fine. <laughs> Next question is from Wagcat. Who is the college football equivalent of Bruce Weber? Not necessarily at K State, but just in general. I, is there one? I mean, I could probably stop and think, but the stakes with football are so substantial. I mean, yeah, I'm, tr- I'm trying to think of of somebody that's won a couple times. I mean, kind kind of Bill Snyder. Let's be real. You know, had some had some nice peaks at times, but did have some lows. Snyder the problem is, Bill, Sn- Bill Snyder's lows were not as low as as this. But I mean, you can draw throughout their careers. Some similarities, I think. I think it's got to be less miles. But he's never had a high with KU. That's the thing. Yeah. But but you're right. Okay, KU's counting. Okay. No, KU's counting his national championship with LSU as their own. They are. <laughs> they are. Mm-hmm. This yeah. guy's a great coach. He's had it. So we'll give him some time. There, there's some truth to that. The, the difference being, at this point, their fans don't care. You know? Cool. It's, we have less miles, coach. That's good enough. I mean, would they prefer to win? Yeah, but nobody's clamoring for a firing. I would imagine it's still twenty eighty to keep less miles right now, or you know what I mean. Eighty yeah. percent want to keep him. Uh, that you're not going to find this in football because the financial stakes are so enormous. There's only a handful of places, and Lawrence, Kansas is one of them, where basketball can bring in enough income to get this done, to run your department. And you know what? They're in big trouble financially. Them not having ticket sales and seat licenses will break their backs. They're in big trouble at KU. K-State's less dependent on that. Oh No, I don't think there's anything comparable. Nor could there possibly be at the Power 5 level. I mean, I'd love to hear people's thoughts, but the way I see it is who in college football has come in to any situation at their at their new school, year one or two, just top of the mountain, and then years three, four, five, you know, starts to slide. And then the, whether there's a rebuild or not, you know, goes to another institution – and is at the top of the mountain there with those players and, and slides it back down. I mean, that's, that's kind of the story of Bruce Weber here. You know, at Illinois, he, he was on the top, slid down, shows up at K-State on the top, slides down, rebuilds K-State, essentially goes back on top, and has now slid back down. So how many, how many coaches can, I even, can you even think of that are, that are of that caliber that can be at the highest highs? And you don't even have to be at the lowest lows, just – you know, five and seven, somebody that's not going to a bowl game when they absolutely should be going to a bowl game. I think Mike Riley at Oregon State ended up at Nebraska, but he never had a high, high at Nebraska. Oh. Well, you talk about a guy that was fairly mediocre except for a few years, had some good years, and got a better job. I mean, it was Oregon State. They were just winning enough. But I, I don't see Scott how you can Fro- be this way. Scott Frost – on top at UCF and then falling off on his way down to Nebraska. I mean, if, if, if for whatever reason, if Scott Frost 
gets a 10 win Nebraska team, that's the answer. But we haven't happened. That hasn't happened yet. If, if Scott Frost can make the New Year's Six in a bowl game, if he can make the Rose Bowl, yeah, Bruce has a comparison there, I think. But beyond that, I have, whew, I don't know anybody who's had just quick success and has fallen off to find success again. Scott Frost has a perfect argument why you don't change coaches just to change. He was a sure thing for Nebraska. I mean, he came in with a great resume. He's one of your own. And it hasn't worked. It's it's crazy. It Changing coaches, no matter how sure you are about your choice, is a risky endeavor. The thing right now for K-State is they don't have much to risk. There isn't much below where you're at. Next question is from K-Ned. With the addition of Chuck Lilly, the recruiting staff is still comparatively undersized before needing to add a portal analyst. The staff is comparatively light on coaching analysts, too. Has the Saban job title loophole call them analysts, not coaches, and have NFL-esque player personnel departments made football so expensive? Athletic departments like K-State can't invest a single dime or extra minute of time before, or pardon me, beyond the bare minimum required for basketball. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the intention was to keep adding, but welcome to the pandemic. I mean, the budget is tight. No adding positions right now at a school such as K-State. So we did add a, uh, an analyst today. Yeah, but a it's special teams analyst. It's but, filling a spot that right, already exists. Right, you're right. Yeah, they're but. not they're not adding to the recruiting staff. I'm with you, man. They got to have more more people. They just do. Whether it's recruiting or I agree, it's time to start having portal people that are in charge of that because it's a major part of the game now. We'll see if they add more coming, but the budget's going to be tight for a few years. There, if there was a surplus, it's getting eaten up. Yeah, I mean, yeah, K-State can't really – it's crazy seeing how how little K-State invests in the football compared to other schools such as Alabama, which in turn means that they, they truly can't invest in other places just to keep up in football. So as long as football is the main driver of revenue, and it, it always will be for, for college football, you know, other, other stuff's going to have to take a back seat. So until, until you can – can, really, I, I would say that K-State football is below the bare minimum there for, for coaches. I mean, it's just like you said, Fitz, it's not enough. There's not enough guys. And and maybe, you know, maybe they, they can find something for basketball or, or figure something out. But, yeah, football is so expensive just based on, on how many staff members you need to compete <laughs> that, that, yeah, K-State's going to struggle until, like we mentioned, until so you can find some big money donors, you no, know, you're, you're stuck where you are. Another question from KNED. Can an athletic department located in the football offices really focus on anything else? I mean, they're kind of spread out, technically. They're not all in veneer. They do have some offices in, in Bramlage and, and elsewhere, but... I don't think it really matters where the location of the office is. I don't know about you, Fitz. Yeah. I'm opposed to having your athletic offices adjacent to any coaching offices. Offices, It's too easy for people to walk in and be a distraction, whether it's the boss or just an underling. Would I want to hang out, if I was working in athletics, would I want to hang out with, you know, people in my offices or do I want to go up and talk football with those guys? I'm, I've been on the record that I think we need to K state needs to put in a new East side structure to dress up that part of the facility. It looks like it's going to be the indoor practice facility, which I think is horrible, but whatever I'd put an East side structure over there with a bill Snyder hall of fame, a hall of fame for all athletics, and your athletic offices. Let's get them out and clear space to do what we just talked about, adding more positions for football. Give them another floor where they can have more meeting space, more coaching space, more analyst space. Uh, yeah, I 
I just don't think it's ideal to have any of that going on. And I probably would prefer then to move other other programs into that facility too and make sure everyone's all together. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. I mean, they've got a lot more facilities to, to build. Volleyball is going to have its own facility. They'll go in there. They'll have an Olympic sports facility. More will go in there. Baseball is now in baseball. Track and field, I, I believe, is in the track and field offices. But when they get the indoor, old indoor facility, maybe there'll be nice, fancy offices that go with that. Hey Fitz, let's let's ask the last question here because we we talk about some facilities okay, here. Cool. Let's not let's just let's get it over with. <laughs> last question of the podcast once again from Kane Ed. How much of the facility master plan did you really expect to be completed before COVID hit? And what do you think is actually feasible ap- after COVID? All of it. I don't think any of it was pie in the sky. I think they did a good job. I mean, they're on track with the football stuff. The only thing that I question is, will they ever really blow out the west side of Bramlage Coliseum? And, you know, I'm not sure if that was in the master plan or just a, an additional thing they'd like to do. Bring the entry down to ground level. Great oh, I idea. think that's part of it. I think that's the whole Bramlage okay. renovation. That, that has to be done. I mean, volleyball's got to be next. And, and the reason I say that is, is twofold. One, you're out of a hern. The, the place has fallen apart. That's, an, that's not an athletic facility anymore. It's an academic. It belongs to the university. And they're not putting any money into it. They're trying to keep dorms up, kept up and classrooms kept up. They don't, they're not going to invest in keeping an old building like that. I, I hope they can repurpose it without tearing it down. But you need to get volleyball into their own facility their own court, get them out of Bramlage because they're they're out of a hern in terms of competition. They've been in Bramlage all year. But give them their own place. They're where Cat Town is. And as Zach and I have discussed in the past, build that court big enough where you can get by playing some basketball games in there. Because there's going to be a year when you can't play in Bramlage. If you're going to blow out a side of the place... I can't imagine you're going to be able to compete in there. Maybe you will do it, but they're talking about putting tunnels in on that west side, the alumni side, so people can enter in mid arena, have some lower, you know, boxes, which is good. It's all good. I hate Bramlage. I hate it. I always have. I just wish it'd get blown up. Would would it be terrible for the volleyball facility to be a women's basketball facility, especially with how you have to have two? I mean, you don't need two separate courts, but there's two separate three point lines. If you want to make a, I know it's aesthetics mostly, but it's, it's annoying seeing how many different three point lines there are on the court and having a smaller facility for women's basketball, especially something that would better fit the number of fans you have. I mean, right now, <laughs> K-State men's basketball couldn't fill a 3,000-seat arena. But, you know, I it, yeah. I think that it'd be it'd be interesting to see. I, I am interested in seeing what they're going to do once it's time for Bramlage to get renovated. Because, you know, what, what alternates do you have? Does Do you build the, faci- the football indoor facility in the parking lot first? Because you could turn that into a temporary arena pretty easily. Um you know, start that. Or do you play a tour around the state of Kansas? Do you go play T-Mobile Center? Do you play Interest Bank Arena? Do you go to Topeka? Which, by the way, they're just completing their renovation of their arena on the inside. They did a really good job of making of of nicing it, nicening the inside of that arena up in Topeka. It's you know, word. you have, you, yeah, you have the Bicentennial Center, Tony's Pizza Event Center. Whatever. Come on, get it right. Whatever. It's the Bicentennial Center uh, in Salina. So, you know, you have options around the state. Do you go on a tour like that, you know, and play some games, games like that? Or do you, you know, try making something work in in Manhattan? And it's going to take some sort of building a temporary arena. Um, I think you do both. I think you you play some of your bigger games in Wichita and Kansas City and, you know, but your non-conference schedule for the most part can be in a temporary facility. Nah. I think they're intending to build it all. They they need it all if they want to compete in the Big 12. I mean, they have an opportunity if they put enough money into that indoor track facility to have a really premier track facility. Now, is that important? 
I mean, that's a, just a real valid question as a school such as K-State that you need to ask. Is it important to be good in track and volleyball and baseball and women's soccer, tennis, golf? Or is the emphasis completely on football, men's basketball? And that's what pays the bills. I think you owe your student-athletes a better than what K-State's currently offering. And I, once again, promise if I win the lottery and it's an excessive amount of money, we will have a volleyball facility called the Fitz. That's not happening. I can't win the lottery. It's like the odds are stacked against me or something. I don't understand. I just want to be a multimillionaire without putting in the work to be a multimillionaire. It's too much to ask, guys. Can I catch a break here by winning, I won't even get greedy, a a $500 million lottery? I didn't have to be a billion. (laughs) Greedy. I'm not going to be greedy at all. So what, 500 million? That'd be like 200 million cash? Yeah, we're going to build the fits. And there's going to be a water fountain out front. Why? Just because we can. PowerCat Podcast. All rights reserved. GoPowerCat.com and Spirit Street Publishing. Hey there, it's Gary Parrish with the Ion College Basketball Podcast, part of the CBS Sports Podcast Network. We are still in the early weeks of conference play, which means there's no better time to tap in every Sunday night. In Wednesday and Friday mornings, you can expect an episode in your feed highlighting everything you need to know from the sport of college basketball, conference races, bracketology, coaching rumors. We'll talk about it all and be there with you at least three times a week as March Madness approaches. It's the Eye on College Basketball podcast. To find us, search for Eye on College Basketball in your podcast app of choice. (music) 